So coming for hyperkalemia, hyperkalemia, potassium anything above 5 to 5.5 is hyperkalemia. There is always, you have to understand whenever you see a potassium, you make sure there is nothing, there is something called pseudo hyperkalemia which is very, very common. Okay, when there is hemolysis, tying a tourniquet, just tying a tourniquet and drawing a blood itself can cause hemolysis. Very, very simple. A lot of people will come with 5.3 unexplained or 5.5, but we just ask, then the next time I ask them not to tie a tourniquet and draw a blood, the potassium comes back to normal. Or this is serum. Sometimes you have a doubt, you can also ask for a plasma potassium. Plasma potassium is always correct. You should always ask for plasma potassium. So, when it counts as more than 50,000, can cause false hyperkalemia, platelet is more than 7.5 lakhs, or muscle activity, keep on punching the veins. A couple of times you puncture and then draw the blood forcefully when the blood is not coming, you keep on puncturing that severely, that is sure your number will come 6.5 or 7 potassium only. Because it can cause a lot of, you know, tissue necrosis. Like anything that happened, hemolysis, rhabdomolysis, or any tumor symptom, all these things can cause pseudo hyperkalemia. And when somebody is on metaprolol, among all the beta blockers, metaprolol we see, when somebody is on metaprolol, that is known to cause again pseudo hyperkalemia. The less is there are other things, maybe we'll all bisoprolol are much better. So, normally somebody needs a beta blocker, but uh, metaprolol is causing that, we should shift on to nebulol or bisoprolol, hypertonic saline. Any advanced renal failure and all those things, as you know, that uh, you can always have hyperkalemia. So, approach. So, looking at the ECG, look at the normal ECG, PQRS complex and the potassium is 4, is normal. When somewhere between 6 to 7, you can have a tall peak T waves. When somebody's potassium is 7 to 8, you can have a flattened P wave, a prolonged PR interval depressed ST segment thing and a peak T wave again and 8 to 9 we will have a completely absence of the P wave, prolonged QRS complex and this is a sine wave with potassium, this sine wave and harassed when the potassium goes high. This is the ECG what you have to look at. So, I, hyperkalemia with ECG, it is an emergency. The only way to treat that will be by calcium, otherwise there is no role of calcium anywhere. I will talk about this more. So, in acute treatment what we have to do? So, IV calcium. Whenever you have ECG changes, only then the IV calcium helps. Others do not treat with IV calcium gluconate unnecessarily because it is of no use. It will not help to decrease the potassium at all because IV calcium gluconate is only helpful when there is ECG changes because to when it acts on the myocardium, when the myocardium is involved because of hyperkalemia, only then the calcium gluconate can help to reverse that, but it will not bring down the potassium making calcium gluconate. Immediately you can shift the potassium into cells by using glucose and insulin or acetylene that is beta 2 agonist. Removing the potassium from the body, the only way is by what you have a calcium polystyrene or sodium polystyrene, that is what you have a K bind or what you call as a K excellent. That is our loop diuretics. So, removing the potassium, only these three, th three things can do. Shifting the potassium into cells, only glucose, insulin, and acetylene can do. But blocks effect of hyperkalemia not only IV calcium can do. So, what is the mechanism of calcium gluconate? So, it raises the action potential. That is the reason after once it raises action potential only then it will from the resting potential then it stabilizes the myocardium. That is the use of calcium gluconate. So, you can get calcium gluconate in 10 ml IV over 2 to 3 minutes. Do not wait for an infusion over 100 ml over 1 hour or something. Just give 10 ml calcium gluconate 10 ml IV over 2 to 3 minutes under continuous but it has to be given under continuous ECG monitoring. The effect starts within 1 to 3 minutes. Calcium gluconate starts within 1 to 3 minutes. It will last for 30 to 60 minutes. In case it is not settling down. Do not wait, keep on repeating it. Repeat the dose. If there is no improvement in abnormal ECG, you repeat the dose. Abnormal ECG recurs after initial improvement, then again it, the ECG can go bad. So, under continuous monitoring, you have to see. Again, if required, you repeat a calcium gluconate. So, again, I am telling the only advantage of IV calcium is when there is ECG changes, there is no role of IV calcium to remove the potassium from the body. So, what does insulin dextrose do? So, what we do is potassium is around 6, you get a call. Immediately, patient has to go for OT you know, we can immediately want to shift, then you can use insulin dextrose. What we normally do is, you can use 25 percent dextrose, 50 ml or 100 ml and add 8 units or 10 units of uh, insulin, okay. This can be given over 1 hour. What happens is the plasma potassium drops 0 0.5 to 1.2 milli equivalents per liter. Effect begins in 10 to 20 minutes and peak at 30 to 60. If somebody is going to OT, we need to correct immediately. We give this, give acetylene and send them to OT and intraoperatively the anesthetist will manage about it. So, this will last for 4 to 6 hours. Again, it is going to bounce back. Again, the potassium is going to go high. Only thing is, once you give this, make sure you check the sugars. What I tell is, after giving insulin dextrose drip, you give monitor sugar every hour for 3 hours. Watch for hypoglycemia. Or otherwise, just give 10% dextrose at 50 to 75 ml with close monitoring blood glucose to be used. Because when you give insulin dextrose, you forget to check sugars. Lot of people we see having severe hypoglycemia after that. And hyperglycemia, 
If the somebody has 200 to 250, no need to give any IV glucose at all. Directly you can give insulin. Soda bicarbonate. We always see in ER people, a lot of people giving sodium bicarbonate. Please don't give. There is no role of treatment of acute, no role of sodium bicarbonate as an acute agent, only single agent in hyperkalemia. So it can be in severe acidosis or hyperkalemia, then we may try. But you know, otherwise isolated, don't use soda bicarbonate at all. Side effect is hypernatremia. In fact, if you use soda bicarbonate, it can cause volume overload, palm edema, will, like, will worsen palm edema and reduce anus calcium. So coming to cation exchange disease, like what we call as a K bind, normally we have sodium or calcium polystyrene. Sodium is not available anymore now. So we use calcium polystyrene sulfonate, that is what you get in K bind. It comes as 15 grams sachet. So what happens either 15 grams to 30 grams, you can use every fourth hourly. You have to mix it with 100 ml water and you have to add a diffalac syrup or sorbillin. Directly don't give with uh, K bind with water alone, it can cause severe constipation. So whenever you get K bind, you just mix it in 15 grams, one sachet and 100 ml saline, uh, water, 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 and you add 10 or 20 ml of diffalac or sorbillin. Mix everything and then you have to ask them to take it, K bind. So one gram binds to one milligrams of potassium. So reduces plasma potassium by 1 milli equivalence in 24. This is the only way to remove potassium from the body. So per rectal also can be given where people can't take oral K bind. Okay, you can add 50 grams in 150 ml per rectal, you can give like enema. At least 30 to 60 minutes it has to stay, then you can do it. So 1 gram of rectal decreases only 0 0.5, whereas orally decreases up to 1 milli equivalence. So side effects, you know, GI irritation, constipation, if somebody has a bowel surgery or something, be careful. Don't use too much of K bind. It can cause bowel necrosis or any bowel necrosis in post operative period. Sometimes then they, they use uh, or disturb any bowel obstruction. So, treatment again, I am telling you IV calcium gluconate, 10 ml IV push, time frame is seconds to minutes, glucose plus insulin, 10 units plus 50 percent glucose, 50 ml or 100 ml. So, 5 to 10 minutes time frame, 30 to 60 minutes is a uh, action. Uh, calcium polystyrene sulfonate, you can add 15 grams or 30 grams you can give, it can stay and remove the water. If it does not respond to any of those things, then we do dialysis, immediately it will come down. So hyponatremia, any sodium less than 135 is hyponatremia. In treating hyponatremia, do not go by the number, go by what the patient, whether the patient is sensorium is normal or abnormal. That is the most important criteria to treat hyponatremia. To Because I have to explain this, I just go fast in this. Oh, sorry. When somebody sodium, when the patient comes with sodium of 120, what to do is once you see the number, do not go by the number, then you, you see the neurological assessment, you talk to him, look at uh, how mentally he is, whether he is conscious oriented towards time, place or person, that is very, very important because do not chase the number. If you chase the number, then you'll, things can go pretty wrong. So always talk to the patient, make sure clinically if he is if he's drowsy, the treatment is different. If he is if he's stable, sensorium is normal, the treatment is absolutely different, even if the number is 115 or 120. So if somebody is number, hyponatremia, you think the number is around 120, I will just give a number, 120, he comes to you. Clinical assessment. Again, hyponatremia is divided into, you have to look at, you have to look at whether clinically he is hypervolemic, uolemic and hypovolemic. That is very, very important. Again, hypovolemic, you know, then you can do all the test urinary spot sodium and all those things help in diagnosing. But hypovolemic, you know, again, the causes of hypovolemic is, you know, dehydration and any drugs which is causing or look for any drugs common is hydrochlorothiazide. The most common cause of hyponatremia, what we see is people will be on hydrochlorothiazide or chlorothalidone. Okay, a lot of people, a lot of references we get hyponatremia is number one is because of drug induced only. So hyponatremia, you have to look for those drugs. If any drugs is there, you please look into that. You will have tell my H or something, CT. So look for those drugs or any laxatives, you know, any, sorry, I am not laxative, diuretics. So look for diuretics. Again, those things are very important which can cause hyponatremia. So clinically, if somebody is dry, Try to fill again, treat like any prerenal, try to hydrate the patient. Sodium automatically will improve by giving just simple normal saline. Then, if somebody is clinically uolemic, that means no clinically is not dry, neither is hyperolemic, the JVP is okay, everything, then what happens is then uh, then we look at clinically uolemia. That is very important. So, you have something called the decreased ECF volume, then we have a normal ECF volume, then this is increased ECF volume. So, decrease, I told you, vomiting, diarrhea, and any sweating, too much of dribbling or look for any diuretic or salt based thing. Normal volume, you know, what happens is you will have hypothyroidism. If hypothyroidism is ruled out, cortisol deficiency is ruled out, the only condition which can cause is SIDH. Most common we see is SIDH, syndrome of inappropriate anti-diuretic hormone secretion. If somebody has a tumor anywhere in the brain or lung tumor or any, anywhere or any inside is anything which can cause SIDH or patient psychiatric, patients on drugs, any psychiatric manifestations, the most common is SIDH we see in clinically uolemic condition. Hypervolemia again, Congestive heart failure, liver failure, nephrotic syndrome, 
all these things you know is hyperolemic so when, it, when you have hyponatremia again you have to look into whether it is a clinically euolemic hypoolemic or hyperolemic based on this only we have to treat after you do a clinical examination then you go by mental status also whether it is conscious oriented if it is conscious oriented normal talking that means it is a chronic hyponatremia don't don't jump and treat with 3% saline that is very very important the other size of extra you all know i don't need to tell about it about volume depletion look for sunken eyes orthostatic hypotension flattened neck veins increased heart rate decreased urine output and decreased body weight all those things you look for in the ecg volume thing if you are not able to make out clinically then about whether it's volume status then you can do investigation wise what are the other things of investigation hypolemia you will be humor concentration you will have increased albumin bun creatin ratio is more than 20 to 1 or elevated bicarbonate these are all in hypolemia if you clinically 90% you can easily make out clinically still you can't make out then these are the differential things euolemia make sure uric acid is less uric acid will less than 5 in sadh bun creatin ratio will be less than 10 is to 1 bicarbonate will be slightly increasing and anion gap will be low in hypovolemia indirect is hemodilution you know the hemoglobin hemodilution happens low albumin bun creatin more than 20 is to 1 and elevated bicarbonate these are all only the test to make out clinically if you are not able to make out the volume status so how do you treat hyponatremia acute look for duration what is the sodium somebody sodium is 142 days ago and suddenly it is 120 that is acute acute hyponatremia don't wait for anything is any acute we have to act immediately okay there are there are lot of symptoms like nausea vomiting headache hiccups mental change confusion chronic you know even the number is 110 105 also a lot of people will have chronically asymptomatic neurologically maybe because the brain would have adapted well so chronically you not have any symptoms so go by thing i told you moderately severe nausea without vomiting confusion headache and uh, severe you will have vomiting even seizures patient can if you don't treat them they can go coma so again how do you treat them any acute hyponatremia you think if so somebody sodium is 120 so so you said basic at least you send uric acid urine spot sodium very important don't start any fluid without sending a urine spot sodium at least and uric acid it is very very important because you know it helps us a lot once you start the treatment there's no point doing any of those test so what is the thumb rule to give 3% saline A lot of people I see admitted in other departments. You know, they give you know sodium is 115 or 120. They give 5 mL of 3% saline or 10 mL per hour. That is wrong. So if somebody at least I tell you how exactly do it. Somebody sodium is 120. He is having little bit you know drowsy or something. You don't need to. At least you go by even one mL per kg body weight. You can give. You can give up to if somebody is 60 kg. You can give up to 50 to 60 mL per hour for two three hours or four five hours. Then again repeat sodium. Don't wait for sodium or doing once in 24 hours. So hyponatremia is very very important. The way you correct it, but don't correct more than 10, 8 to 12 or 10 to 12 milli equivalents in 24 hours. Like somebody is 115, make sure you correct rapidly. Means at least around 8 to 10 minutes. At least by 125 to 127, you can correct in 24 hours. That should be the target. But don't give just 3, 5 mL per hour or 10 mL per hour or 15 mL. In that way, you are not sure confident about it. At least start 30 mL or you know 70 kg old man, you start 30 mL or 40 mL per hour. But make sure you repeat every six hours. you know the value and then you continue it otherwise just don't put on 30 ml 24 hours don't sleep on that so if you if you have difficulty otherwise there's lot of formulas i don't want to tell you all the formulas because very too much there's lot of formulas to treat hyponatremia but at least what i tell you is at least if somebody is sodium is 120 and it's acute hyponatremia if you want to start 3% saline start 30 or 40 ml per hour in elderly 70 year 70 but every after 6 hours again repeat it get the report in 1 hour again the sodium is less again you continue doing it but unless you do that don't start like that always use formulas properly and then you have to treat properly but just giving 5 ml or 10 ml you know this is a common mistake we see everywhere it is not going to anywhere because in acute hyponatremia we have treated even 50 to 60 75 ml per hour for couple hours then we come back slowly that is how we have to treat that is a, then also you can use lasix along with hypotonic saline because sodium low doesn't mean that the only the sodium is less there will be lot of water so it's basically the problem with the water so we have to excrete the water to excrete the water we have to give diuretic so lasix helps then 3% saline also helps along with that 